So welcome back. This is part two of Introduction to Apache Spark from Business Analyst. If you're just joining us, I would obviously encourage you to listen to part one. Um, but if not, I'll qu quickly summarize where we left off. I was ranting about how Spark, Apache Spark, is code, and to use it, you write code. So there's a lot of coding going on, and I never hear that talked about. Oh, Spark drive power self-driving cars. It's also code, though, so just make sure if you want to use it, you're <laughs> willing to write some code. Um, but so, what else is Spark? Spark is this general processing engine for big data. So what does that mean? Let's go back in time. Oh, and it's also very fast. I'm sure you've heard that. So let's go back in time uh, to this bygone era of the early 2000s, when if you wanted to process lots and lots of data, you bought a big server from a company like Oracle, and you put your data in it, and you, you turned through it, you did it really fast. And they spent a lot of time on that technology, maybe even decades. So you paid them a lot of money for it, but it worked extremely well. There was one slight problem, though. Web 2.0 era starts in the early 2000s, and companies start generating massively more amounts of data. So you start to see this data curve that I'm not going to show you because I'm sure you've seen it, but the rate of data growth just explodes. So what does this mean for your business? Whatever cycle you previously upgraded your machine when you bought that big Oracle box, when you could no longer store and process your data on that machine, you had to go back to them and buy a new one. You had to buy an entirely new system, right? There was no easy way to say, just add a little bit more RAM and disk to this thing. And when you did that, you spent lots of money to do it. And maybe previously that only occurred at an interval that was help, that was easy enough for your business to handle. But with this data explosion, all of a sudden, the time between your, your need to buy machines dropped immensely. And worse, it made it really hard for you to forecast. When do I need to buy a new one? You couldn't even really predict because it's like, oh, man, data is just exploding. So as a result, people got very interested when Google wrote two papers in the early 2000s. And they said, well, the way we store and process large amounts of data is we store it on something called the Google File System, where we can link up lots of commodity hardware, the cheap hardware, and we can store data on all of those. And if one of those those servers dies, which cheap servers tend to do pretty regularly, especially if you have thousands of them in a cluster, it's no big deal because the data will be replicated elsewhere. So this was a powerful concept. But it was like, well, wait, how are you analyzing it? And they said, aha, we have a second paper, MapReduce. And so what we do is we are able to push our analysis to these nodes. We're able to use these machines in parallel. This is a really big deal because now you can do things a lot faster. Instead of having one really big ox, you had lots of small oxen. You could pull the wagon. Awesome. Unfortunately, no one could use it. That was for a couple of years until a few guys led by Doug Cunning created what is now known as Hadoop. So what is Hadoop? At its core, it's two components. Instead of the Google file system, it is the Hadoop distributed file system. Same idea. Parallel storage or distributed storage, where if, if a node fails, a computer dies, don't worry, you didn't lose your data. And then MapReduce, this way of analyzing data, processing data on all of those different computers, using computers to work in parallel. Big deal. There was a slight problem, though, which people realized, the, you know, the buzz didn't quite catch up to this, but it was just, hey, this MapReduce concept at, for certain operations can be really slow, especially for analytical stuff, like, like machine learning algorithms, or even for just ad hoc querying, like a, what type of machine learning algorithm, I don't really know. But I do know that I may want to get on the shell. I want to write some ad hoc queries where I, I type, I query something, and then I say, oh, that's not what I wanted. I query it again, I query it again, I query it again. I keep changing, oh, I made a mistake, I missed a semicolon, okay, query it again. That kind of stuff takes a long time if you're using MapReduce. And worse, you may have some syntax issues because you may have to write your MapReduce job in, uh, in Java, and it's ugly. So Spark is, hey, can we make this faster and less painless at, at the very highest level? So if at the lowest level, Spark is code, at the highest level, it's a faster, easier way to process data that exists on a cluster of computers. So we're still using HDFS or whatever, wherever you want to store your data, but let's, you are able to work with HDFS, you have your data distributed, processing it with MapReduce can be too slow. Okay, Spark is the answer. Now it's much faster. So I, I do want to really hammer home this warning at the beginning. You have to code to use Spark. There's no getting around it. But I think there is a really important distinction, which is you don't have to code to analyze data per se. You absolutely have to code to gather it. So what do I mean by this? I can analyze data just as you've been doing in Excel or in Tableau or in the myriad of other tools that allow you to maybe write some formulas or do some other work within the tool, but you're not writing, you're not writing scripts to analyze your data. This is very important. You can keep doing that. I'm not trying to prevent you from doing that. I want to put, you know, red flag or white flag, like, please continue to analyze your data there. The problem is you do have the code to gather data. What do I mean by this? How do you gather data in Excel right now? 
The answer is you don't. Like, maybe you can make a database connection in Excel, but for the most part, I bet almost all of you are just opening up files people have emailed you. Email is a terrible ETL tool. So what I think you should be able to do is you should be able to say, hey, I have this information about a customer. I can see the products this person has purchased over the last six months. Maybe somebody in IT gave me that spreadsheet. Okay, great. What is this person saying about our company on Twitter? How do I do that in Excel? How do I do that in Tableau? You can't, right? You're going to write a little bit of code, just a few lines, which we can show another time, and you're going to go to Twitter and say, I'd like to know what this person is talking about. And Twitter will say, if you've registered with our API, our application programming interface, you're allowed to send us a message in the form of a few lines of code, and we'll give you back some data about the person. Just a few lines of code can open up this whole new world of information. Obviously, this is a big data presentation. We're talking about Apache Spark. So if you want to gather and do a little bit of processing of large amounts of data, there's no way to do that in a GUI tool. There's no way to do that in Excel. You're going to need code to do it. Um, but I think this is a really important point because not only do is it, uh, there is code, <laughs> is gathering data with code, I think, the, really the only way to do it, but learning to code and learning to do analysis is a very difficult thing. And many coding tutorials start by telling you, well, let's teach you how to do some cool analytical concept like a machine learning algorithm that you can't do in Excel because, hey, I want to show you. You can't do this in Excel. This is why you should learn to code. But there's a problem here. Most people who come into that to the, or who are going to read that tutorial effectively, they either A, already knew what the algorithm was, or B, already knew how to code in some other language. So they only have to learn one thing, the algorithm or the code. You, on the other hand, have to learn both. And I think this is these two hills are too, are too much. And I, I, I struggle with these tutorials, so I want to I want to focus us in a slightly at a slightly different angle here. We're not going to worry about those analytical techniques. Instead, we're just going to learn about how to gather data. I'm not saying gathering data is easy, but there are so many tools out there to help us do analysis, and you can always go read one of these tutorials later on how to implement a machine learning algorithm with whatever code you're learning. But you absolutely have to step one to gather some data, and I don't believe there's any way to gather data easily without code. So caveat over, we're going to be coding, we're going to be coding to gather data, we're not going to be coding to do complicated analysis. Stick with me, you can do this. You can do this. Say it again. Here's how I know. I know because if you're using Excel, Excel formulas are super hard. Take a second and read these two formulas. It looks pretty complicated, doesn't it? Is it intuitive what's going on here? No. And why is that? Well, right off the bat, there's no data here. When you look at an Excel formula, you're looking at it within a spreadsheet. You see the information for the most part that it's it's working on. If, if you hit, what is it, F2 or whatever within the formula F9, you can look in highlighted rows and columns of the data where that, that's being analyzed in that formula. The worksheet or something, you can't see it directly. You have context. When you look at code, you're always going to be looking at code without the context of the data that it's working, that it's manipulating, that's processing. So this makes it so much more difficult. If you could see the data, if you could see this relationship between the two, you would probably draw links a lot faster. So what I want to do, instead of finding an innovative way to do that, is instead just pull Excel formulas out of the context of a spreadsheet and say, hey, listen, this is hard too, but you're okay with doing this. Second point, when you actually look at how esoteric some Excel formulas are that I venture to guess you use on a daily basis, you'll realize that this, these coding concepts are not that challenging. You're smarter than you think you are. The problem is no one gives you credit. More importantly, you yourself do not give yourself credit for learning some of the things you've learned in Excel. Let's take the VLOOKUP, for example. The VLOOKUP is a ridiculously silly formula. What's going on in the VLOOKUP? Well, for one, what's the name? It stands for vertical lookup. Okay, so I'm going to look things up vertically. I guess I get that. The first argument to a VLOOKUP is the term that I want to look up, the thing I want to find. Okay, I'm, that kind of makes sense. The second argument is the array in which I want to look. And there's an important point here. The value that you want to find, you have to make sure you start that array right in the leftmost column. Otherwise, the VLOOKUP doesn't work. Why is that the case? Why does it have to be the leftmost column? What's going on here? I, to me, that doesn't really make any sense. And there's nothing intuitive about the name VLOOKUP when, when you start to learn about the formula that says, well, of course it has to be the leftmost column. Now that's self-evident. I didn't freaking get that. That's confusing. I screwed this up so many times when I was learning the VLOOKUP. Third argument, or second, yeah, third argument the column number you want to find. So you have to specifically say, I want to go to this column number. I told you, start here at this leftmost column and go to this column number. That seems really unnecessarily specific. And then, the you know, you, oh, I don't know. Maybe what if I don't know? I mean, I'm just there formulas for this, but that's tough. The second and the final argument is true-false. So do I want an exact match or a fuzzy match? And false is exact match. Of course I want exact match. This is, I find, really frustrating. 
what, why would I have to specify that 